Um, so I'm from the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, just over the mountains in Boulder, um, Global Monitoring Division. We're the people who, along with our global collaborators, brought you 400 ppm of CO2 recently. Um, however, today, although I am going to mention some stuff about CO2, I want to focus on what I think is the most interesting gas in the atmosphere, methane. And the reason I think it's the most interesting gas is because, well, in addition to all kinds of natural sources which are sensitive to climate changes, um, humans have a big part in what we see in the atmosphere uh, in terms of methane. We affect the methane budget through virtually everything we do, from how we grow our food, cattle and rice, um, to how we dispose of our waste, uh, to how we power our society. Um, so I think methane is a fascinating gas. It's also a very potent greenhouse gas. And it actually does have a 10-year lifetime in the atmosphere. It, um, it uh, is photochemically decomposed, and the end product of a long chain of reactions is, in fact, CO2. So just a little background on methane. Um, and now the f I want to talk about the Arctic. And just to um, put us all at the same starting point, um, I'm going to list some of the issues and concerns in the Arctic. First of all, as most of us probably know, the Arctic has been the scene of some of the largest temperature changes um, observed over the um, last half century. Um, and in fact, since 1980, the temperature increase in, up there has been about uh, 0.6 degrees Celsius per decade. And if you look at the more recent decade, it, it could be as much as twice this. Um, so temperatures are changing very quickly up there. Also, as we all know, there's rapidly melting ice on the sea and land. Um, and accompanying this is going to be probable expansion of human activities. Um, we'll probably be drilling more up there, extracting minerals, and we'll be uh, using open Arctic waters for transportation. Um, so we have the potential to um, affect the budgets of greenhouse gases even more by our presence up there in the future. Ominously, about 1,700 petagrams of carbon are thought to be stored in permafrost soils. This is a staggering amount of carbon. It's several times the amount that we've already emitted by fossil fuel combustion. And um, some studies are looking at how fast this uh, carbon may emerge and enter the atmosphere. And we don't really know whether it's going to be methane, which has a higher greenhouse warming potential, or CO2. That depends on how the hydrology evolves up in the Arctic. Uh, but one recent study suggests that 215 to 380 petagrams of carbon may thaw by 2100. That doesn't mean it will go into the atmosphere, but if you were to suddenly dump all of this carbon into the atmosphere and not let it be taken up by the biosphere or the oceans, you could raise atmospheric CO2 by 100 to 180 ppm. This is um, an amount that is uh, worth taking into an account if we're going to try to have legislation or treaties to try to limit emissions, we will have to consider um, possible inputs from the Arctic. Um, now, there is some paleo evidence that permafrost carbon feedbacks have operated in the past. And this slide is based on a paper that appeared in Nature in 2012 by DeCanto et al. And they found, um, based on models and some paleo evidence, that Orbital forcing and permafrost carbon feedbacks could explain the hyperthermal events of 55 million years ago, when the temperature increased globally by about 5 degrees Celsius within only a few thousand years. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that there was thought to be about twice as much carbon in the Eocene permafrost as we think we have today. And in fact, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, there was permafrost, unlike today, where we don't think uh, we have that kind of issue down there. And the beast I have in this picture is just, uh, I guess it's a museum model of some kind of creature that might have lived during these warm times in the Eocene. An interesting question is whether emissions have been changing already. And last year there was a paper headed by McGuire which did a meta-analysis of uh, emissions based on flux measurements and in the case of CO2 also process models. And this study found that CO2 is taken up 
um, more in the 2000s than it was in the 1990s when the Arctic operated as a source of carbon. Now it's a small sink of carbon, and this is undoubtedly linked to the fact that the Arctic is greening as the temperatures warm up there and the growing season becomes longer and conditions are more favorable. Methane, on the other hand, um, the emissions of it are thought to have doubled between the 1990s and the 2000s. So it's of interest to see whether we can see a signal of this in the atmosphere. And what our lab does is we help to coordinate global observing um, networks that take measurements of greenhouse gases and other species at the surface. And this is what we have to work with in the Arctic at the present time. The yellow sites are NOAA sites. Um, there's one Russian site, Terraburka. The Canadians are putting in a bunch of new sites that are located near wetlands, which will be very interesting. And those are the red sites. And many of these have just come online. And then there are two sad gray sites, and those are um, sites that have been shut down. And I will say in the current funding environment, many of our sites are under pressure. And we may actually ha lose some of these sites, which in my opinion would be a tragedy, especially if it were to be some of the sites uh, with very long data records, and by very long, I mean going back to the early 1980s. There aren't many of these sites, but they are extremely valuable. And Station Mike, STM there, is one of our long-term sites that was shut down recently. So now the reason we need these long observational records is because the kind of changes we're expecting in greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm um, going to take the example of methane here, well, they're probably pretty small. And we know from our experience with global temperature records that you need a long time series to pick out signals. And so what I'm showing you here is just a model study. Um, I ran a control with contemporary emissions, and then I allowed the emissions to be perturbed by a percent per year, 5% per year. Incidentally, a percent per year is kind of what we might expect to happen just from what we know about how uh, methane emissions respond to temperature changes. And the bottom is the control subtracted from the two perturbation runs. And you can see that over a 10-year period, the 1% per year increase doesn't register much of a change. Um, you really need to have something extremely large to see it in this kind of short record. So it's extremely important to preserve these records. And now some people hope that satellites will come in and save the day. And it's not clear that that will happen, especially in the Arctic, where it's, um, very, it's often very cloudy, there's long path lengths through the atmosphere, there's a lot of aerosols. Um, this is an example of an instrument, the AIRS instrument, that measures methane, and it's sensitive to the mid-troposphere. And I'm showing it next to a picture showing you the sea ice um, loss in percent. And you'll see that the satellite data looks a little bit suspicious. But this has not stopped a blogger from reporting that the image on the right is proof that methane is bubbling out of the Arctic Oceans at an unprecedented rate. And this kind of, um, I guess I'm showing this, it's kind of interesting to note that this kind of uh, blogging and opinion, it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be skeptics that are a problem. It can also come from overzealous people who are, um, who are eager to raise the alarm. In this case, it's probably a data artifact and not an actual alarm that needs to be raised. So back to science, though. Um, the question is, how do you get from something that we observe, like this time series here, to something that we want to know, which is the distribution of emissions. Because after all, this figure here contains influence from lower uh, latitude signals, perhaps from humans uh, releasing um, fossil fuel emissions or from cattle uh, burping, and it is burping, by the way, mostly. Um, so the way we do that is we use models. And we use a numerical technique that's very similar to weather forecasting. We have a transport model. We have some first guess of what the emissions are, which are these red peaks here. These are um, wetland emissions, and this is a seasonal cycle, which I'm using as a first guess for this thing. We run the transport model with our first guess. Then we systematically compare with observations, and we figure out how we need to adjust the sources to be in optimal agreement with observations. And the blue is what you get from doing this assimilation process. And what I want to point out is that you get interannual variability, but you don't get a trend, at least not over this relatively short period of time. But the variability does uh, agree with what we know should have happened based on what we understand about how emissions are sensitive to temperature changes. So for example, 2007 was an extremely warm year in the Arctic, 
And uh, as you can see from the GIST surface temperature analysis, and you see a big spike in the emissions from the wetlands in the Arctic in both Eurasia and North America. But the next year, it got cooler in North America, uh, but in boreal Eurasia, it stayed warmer. Oops. And you can see that the emissions stayed high. So this kind of um, agreement gives us some confidence that we're recovering some actual information that's worthwhile. Uh, but again, we're not seeing some kind of trend over this, over this period um, yet. I'm going to skip this um, and move right on to another issue that I want to talk about, which is what the frack is going on with fugitive emissions from fossil fuel production. Um, the EPA, some of you might have seen in the news, has recently revised their estimates of emissions of methane from fossil fuel exploration, and they decreased it by, I think, a factor of two, a really, fairly large decrease. On the other hand, uh, we know, whoops, especially in the lower 48, that we're currently seeing a boom in oil and gas drilling, and some of my colleagues have actually driven around some of these shale gas plays, and they have found that, lo and behold, emissions are much higher than the industry reports and um, higher than the EPA reports. Well, that's not a mystery since the EPA is relying on industry um, estimates a lot of the times. But the um, network data and the assimilation product also suggest that something is going on. If you look at um, the same thing that I was just showing you, emissions estimates for the Arctic, and you look at North America fossil fuel emissions, and furthermore, you look in the winter when the biogenic sources are small, you see that the first guess is much lower usually than what the in inversion ends up getting. The inversion is actually would suggest that fossil fuel emissions from temperate North America are much larger. And if you go and look to see what sites are producing this kind of difference, you can see that, for example, this site, Southern Great Plains in Oklahoma, as time goes on, it becomes progressively harder to fit our first guess for what the emissions are. And this is support for the idea that emissions from um, the current oil and gas boom are probably underreported. And an interesting question is, what happens when this technology spreads throughout the world? I've seen um, some economic analyses that suggest that there's not enough of this shale gas uh, to really make a dent in our long-term fossil fuel cumulative emissions. However, um, I think it remains to be seen whether that ends up being true. Just recently, uh, there were reports that Poland is going to start using hydrofracking, and I think emissions all over the world may start to increase in this kind of manner. Uh, now, I want to make one other point, and that is that these surface observations are useful also for refining our ability to predict what's going to happen to our climate uh, in the future. And the, the surface observations provide a very good check on whether we're getting it right. So if you look at this plot here on the upper right, you'll see that there's some black squares that those are actual observations. All the different colors are bottom-up models of wetland emissions from, of methane. And I initialized them all to the same value, then I ran them forward, and you can see that there's quite a large variation between what the models are predicting and what the data says actually happened. And you can go in here and ask yourself whether you got the right seasonal cycle. For example, some of these models are um, predicting summertime maxima, and we know from the data that, that that's probably not right. Um, some of them predict unrealistic meridional gradients, so they probably, they have their wetland distributions not quite right. And then if you go use a regional model, you'll see that you get kind of the opposite picture. The data, again, are black. These are aircraft data from a field campaign. And the colored lines show you these different models. And now they appear to be under predicting uh, what was actually observed. So the data are an important check on whether or not our process models are capable of representing the actual atmosphere. And this is a really important thing because some of these models are being used in coupled climate simulations. And if we can't get today right, if you can't get the annual cycle today, then what does that imply about your predictions for the future? So yet another reason why we need to continue these kind of surface results, uh, surface um, measurements. So in summary, I would just like to say we don't see any significant changes in the Arctic carbon budgets yet in the atmosphere. Uh, but we don't actually understand why 
or when it will start if it's going to happen at all. So it's a, it's a field where there's a lot of research going on right now, and I'm going to end there. I guess I'm early.